At Schoolbox, we're extremely passionate about both education and technology, so it's, I'm thrilled to be able to introduce someone who takes critical messages about schools, learning, culture and leadership and elevates action within the education system through a couple of groundbreaking businesses, real schools and in the corporate world, real learners. He's passionate for empowering uh, dedicated leaders and educators with the tools, skills and attitudes necessary to build meaningful relationships that are productive wherever they are, and for these relationships to be leveraged for a new level of learner performance and leader potential. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and give a very warm welcome to our keynote speaker and coach and author, Adam Voigt. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. It was a bit lacklustre, wasn't it? I, I don't know if you caught in the intro, I don't know if Peter threw it in there, I'm a former school principal, and we have a thing about greetings. Okay, you know the, for, the, the greeting that you're supposed to provide to a former school principal, don't you? Particularly a primary school one. No matter how excited, no matter how enthusiastic you're feeling about being here today, if a principal walks into the room and says good morning to you, you are expected to present your eyebrows, <laughs> to lower your voice, and in the most sombre tone possible, you are expected to say good morning, Mr. Voigt. Not exactly the best way to start a conference, though, is it? Not exactly the best way to open a school either. I had a great opportunity to do that a few years ago when I opened Rosebury Primary School and we were different. There were many things that were different about Rosebury Primary School. We developed a co-teaching model for the 350 kids that arrived on day one because there was not one single classroom in our school. Every, every piece of architecture was two learning spaces, two teachers working together with up to 50 children. We were a school without a library because the architects decided that rather than have our students wait for 50 minutes for once a week for their opportunity to access those resources, we should take the resources to where they were using, doing their learning in breakout spaces and provide every one of our teachers with a barcode scanner. We co-located with the middle school, which presented its own set of challenges on enrolment for the preschool students, whose parents were concerned that the year nines would be selling them drugs. <laughs> there were questions we could get past. And yet here I was about to open a school that was incredibly different, Yet on day one, I was about to stand there at this moment just before our very first school assembly and deliver to them the exact same good morning that has been delivered by primary school principals for the last 200 years. And in my head, I thought, don't do that. But my head also spoke to me as I said to the, to the assembly, good morning, everyone. But before you say good morning, you'll notice there are many things that are different about our school. We've talked about the, the library, talked about the open learning spaces, talked about the middle school, including the way that we say good morning. And the back of my head said to me, you still don't know how you're going to say good morning. <laughs> and so I did what any diligent, professional, creative school leader in that situation does. You make something up. And so I said to them, well, the way we're going to say good morning is with excitement and enthusiasm. So if you would, stand up for me for a second. I oh, know, everyone's going, oh no, he's going to be one of those interactive people, <laughs> isn't he? <laughs> You'll be sitting down again in a minute, all right? The way we said good morning at Rosemary Primary School is like this. I'm going to say good morning to you with excitement and enthusiasm, and then I'm going to clap twice. Got me on that? Your job is just to say good morning, Mr. Voigt, back to me, and to clap twice. Got me on that? The preschoolers that you can see right up the front there, barely four years of age, they got this right, second go. <laughs> You're under pressure. All right, ready to go? Yeah. All right. Good morning, everyone. I'm doing my teacher thing here. I'm differentiating. I'm, lo I'm looking for my gifted and talented table. Still looking. <laughs> I'm looking for my wombat's table. Okay. A little worried about what's going on down here. It's a little bit of a sequencing issue down here at the front. They're not having quite caught on to talk first, clap second, and there's a whole lot of Mr. Myers boy! Okay. Just settle, you guys, okay? It's talk first, clap second. You can get this right second go. Ready? Good morning, everyone. Yeah, that's actually not bad. Well done, well done. Grab a seat, grab a seat. I didn't think it was much of a big deal. I just thought it was a naff or interesting or fun way to start that assembly on, on day one. Yet, when I left Rosebury Primary School and I founded Real Schools, I hung around Darwin, which is where this school was. Um, I hung around for another year while I founded the business. And Darwin's not a big place, so you're constantly running into people who you know at sporting events and in car parks and at traffic lights. And what I found, what I discovered that I thought was incredibly interesting was that no one came and thanked me for the brilliant Australian first co-teaching model we developed. No one came and thanked me for the way that their students were able to access reading resources whenever they wanted to. 
And no one came and thanked me for mitigating the greatest risk you can put in front of academic trajectory, which is to be the new kid. And we had 350 kids who were the brand new kid on day one. 36 different schools on the previous day that they had been to school. No one came and thanked me for it. All I had was people sneaking up behind me in the freezer section of the supermarket and saying, morning, Mr. Voigt. <laughs> and it struck me that when you're talking about culture, when you're talking about what people take away with them from the educative experience, it's the little things done ritually, repetitively, and through relationship that make the biggest difference to people. And I think that that means the imperative for educators and for school leaders is to start to bring that into focus. I think that what we realise when we do that is that the way that we've been looking at education is perhaps through the wrong filter. I think we've been looking at it as though it should be a delivery or a distribution model, which is exactly the way that the old milkman used to look at his work. He has a commodity that he needs to deliver, milk. And all he needs is a distribution model in order to be able to do it. He needs a horse, he needs some cans, he needs a cart, he needs a tiny bit of engagement from the people that he's delivering to. Could you just leave the milk bottles out? And then we can get, and then we can get our job done. The problem is that only that tiny little bit of engagement, and that, even that dropped away, didn't it, eventually, as we moved to cartons, the tiny little bit of engagement he gets means that the people who are actually receiving the service don't really care or don't really understand and don't really get how the whole thing happens. Ask kids these days, where does milk come from? What's the most likely response? Supermarket, <laughs> okay? They just don't get, and they don't really have to in a distribution or a delivery model. When we take that view of education, we view it as though all we have to do is deliver content. All we have to do is deliver curriculum. And we find ourselves standing in powerful positions at the front of the classroom acting like knowledge sprinklers. Just hoping that some of that sticks. And I don't think that matches with what our purpose is for being educators. In fact, when I think we take the mismatch of thinking that education is a delivery model, I think when we take the mismatch, the evidence around us is rather disturbing. <laughs> when all we do is stand at the front of a classroom and deliver information, we can sometimes get feedback that we are delivering beautifully. Have a look at what Margie's feedback is. She's letting poor old Tone know that he is doing a bang up job. How good are you going, Tone? You're up there delivering an important message about how all of them are going to hell if their parents voted for same-sex marriage or something really important and life-skilly like that. But no matter what he's delivering, it's just not landing. And what I think we need to do in education is start to shift our filter and our focus towards thinking about how is it landing? How is it receiving? As John Hattie says, know thy impact. And it's not just in terms of progress academically that I think we should be viewing it. It should be about how much our kids love learning. As a couple of us were discussing before the conference today, it's not just about whether your kids are equipped with knowledge and skills about the, that dictates whether they're going to be successful in the future or not. It's about how much they love learning and view themselves as good learners because, boy, they're going to have to learn on the job, aren't they? So what I would like to do today is to start to talk about how we can create a culture where that love of learning is genuinely fostered and where there's a match between what you think and what you believe is important and the way you operate. Can I just check in on that first? Just put your hand up if you think that the culture of a school is important. Good, good, keep them up, keep them up, keep them up, keep them up. Because what I'd like to do is randomly select one of you in a minute to come out the front and, and tell me what the correct definition of school culture is. A lot of hands going down in there now. <laughs> Even the ones that have still got it up are going, oh no, <laughs> he's going to see me if I move. And, I, and we, isn't it funny that I ask people, is school culture important? All the hands fly up. And then I ask people what it is and we turn into, you know the great Australian movie, The Castle? You know the lawyer, Dennis DeNuto? And I'm not talking about the photocopier scene. Um, I'm talking about the scene when he's asked to describe the constitution. And he says, it's the vibe, it's Marbo. <laughs> yeah. and, and I think that isn't it funny that all of us say that it's important and we, know what, and, and we think it really matters, yet ask us to work on it, we don't even know what it is. So here's my working definition of what a culture is. A culture, particularly in a school, is a behavioural set. And there are two types of behaviour that build, there's two piles of behaviour, if you will, within this big amorphous set. Okay? There are the behaviours that we encourage. There are the behaviours in all of the stakeholders in the school that we say, love that, that's fantastic. Do it again, do it more creatively, do it more often, have a sticker. And then whether we like it or not, there are the behaviours within a culture that we tolerate. And it's possibly because we haven't found the skill, the will or the time 
to tackle that with any repeated methodology. And why have we not found the time? I would suggest that it's because an overemphasis and an obsession about quality teaching. Because the way that we've tackled, and this sounds noble that we should focus on the quality of teaching, but the way that we've tackled it is to add program. We put reading recovery over here, and then we put a count me in two maths over there, and then we put restorative practices, and then we put one to one laptop program, and I've sort of come to view them as being standing around like a bunch of tradies on a work site. And their job is to throw a grappling hook from that plane over onto the student learning outcome line and pull tight, because that's how we're measured. And I sort of see them standing around on Smoko in October and they're starting to get tired and they're dirty and grimy and I've just about had enough with the whole thing. And then a new one wanders in, in beautifully clean pressed overalls and they look at him and they go, what do you want? And he goes, no, honestly, I'm just here to help. I'm just another tradie on site. I'm just here to, you know, I just want to chip in and do my job. Says, yeah, well, who are you? And he says, I'm... I'm Christmas concert. <laughs> and they go, Christmas concert, fair dinkum. And reading recovery goes, don't worry, I'll step out of the way so Christmas concert can have a, way, have a go. And, and one to one laptop says, no, come back, reading recovery, you're incredibly important, we need you here. And everyone like that. we're just going to have to squeeze you in. Christmas concert, how much time do you need? It's only about three and a half days a week through term four. <laughs> Fantastic. Anyway. And what I've come to believe is that perhaps, the, that perhaps the imperative in front of us is not to add another program over there. Perhaps it's to realise that there's another plane in this map, on this graph. Perhaps it's to realise that if we can plant our programs in a decent, relational, strong, sustainable culture, then they have the chance to thrive and to do what they want to do. So what I want to do today is to move your focus towards what it takes to build that culture. Oops. And the first one that I think is just the, the first thing that I think we need to attend to is the commitment of our teachers. Now, it is dangerous. I will just about need my cricket helmet, as, you, as some of the other people who work here need, to be able to say, I'm going to come along and talk to a room full of strangers in education about your commitment. Bit dangerous, isn't it? And the reason that's dangerous is because we keep measuring teacher commitment through the wrong, with the wrong rulers. We keep measuring it with time and effort. And I've certainly made that mistake. This is a... Um, a postcard that we use when we train with our partner schools around committed teachers. And I talked to them about a story where I made that mistake when I was the principal at Rosebury Primary School, brand new school. And I became convinced somehow that I needed to be the, seen as being the most dedicated and committed educator in the, in the school, just by virtue of the fact that I was the highest paid employee in the organisation. And I, want, and, I thought, and I didn't do it consciously, but somehow subconsciously I came up with a measure of that dedication and commitment it was my car. I needed my teachers to see my car when they arrived and I needed to, them to see it when I left. And I was very frustrated. And in the Northern Territory, because of the heat thing, the kids are there learning at 8 o'clock in the morning. So I'm arriving at school at 6.30 in the morning. And I'm pulling into the car park and I'm seeing to the left of me Mick's car. And I'm looking down in the classrooms and I see the light on in Mick's classroom. And so again, I do what any dedicated and professional and diligent school leader would do in such circumstances. I just start setting my alarm clock five minutes earlier every day because I've got to beat Mick to school. And I arrived just before six o'clock one day and I saw Mick's car and Mick's light on and I was like, no way, I can't have this anymore. So I walked into my office and I dropped my bag and I walked straight down there. I thought, I've got to find out what's going on here. And I had a little moment where I went, oh, just go slowly. New school, you don't know Mick all that well yet. You know, this could even be like a mental health or a, you know, any sort of problem. Just walk in with your eyes open and assess what's going on. And I walked in to that classroom, there's Mick in a double classroom with a singlet on and a pair of SpongeBob SquarePants boxer shorts. He's got the smart board on at one end of the room with his Facebook account open and at the other end of the room he's wheeled in a television and sunrise is starting. And I said to him, g'day Mick. And he went, g'day boss, you're here really? I said, oh no. <laughs> I said, what are you doing here Mick at this time of the day? And he goes, this is my favourite time of the day, what are you talking about? I said, what do you mean? And he said, I've got two teenage boys at home. I said, yeah? He said, if you think that I'm staying home for the shit fight that is getting them to school every day, <laughs> you've got another thing coming. He said, I have outsourced that problem to my wife. <laughs> you won't be shocked at Mick's current marital status. <laughs> and I looked at Mick standing there in his wonderful regalia with his bowl of Nutrigrain in his hand and I went, Righto. And I walked away. 
and I, as I walked back to my office, I thought, wow, you thought you possibly had the most dedicated and committed teacher in the Northern Territory. And you just had the bloke that hates his family the most. <laughs> We've got to stop measuring commitment by time and effort and start measuring it by a willingness to sit together in practice and discuss changes that we're going to make, to make big decisions about the way that we're going to change things in our school. And as school leaders, our imperative is to structure so that those pieces of dialogue happen. The next thing we want to do is to start to focus on the caring level of our students, to talk about building student empathy. Can I get a quick show of hands? Don't be frightened, there's no follow-up question on this one. All right. Quick show of hands if you're just a little bit concerned about our kids becoming a little bit too inward, a little bit too self-centred, a little bit too lacking in empathy. Yeah, and, and I'm both concerned and optimistic about that. Because what I know about empathy and what I know about building caring in students is that the switch is there. Because every single feeling, every single social capacity that we, we have comes from within our brain and it has evolved within us over thousands and thousands of years. It is there. You can't turn empathy off that quickly. What we have to do is to put them in an environment where they start to empathise. And this means understanding the brain just a little better than we would normally. Now, if you're an educator in Australia over the last two or three years, you've been hit over the head at some stage with Carol Dweck's growth mindset stuff and it's good, it's really good. But even Dweck has had to address that there's a little bit of an issue we've got in that is that there's an army of people around Australia now who are thinking that they're either a left-brainer or a right-brainer. You're either creative or you're detail-oriented, and it's not true. Your propensity to use one side of the brain or the other is quite slight. So I tend to think that perhaps a more useful view of the brain in the learning environment is to look from the side. And when we do look at the side, we see, two we see four components at play. Um, two that are kind of interesting, and two that are, for me, absolutely critically important for educators to know. The two that are interesting are the cerebellum and the stem. So the cerebellum is kind of the computer that controls the machine. So it's the part that allows me to look at my right hand and say close, and it does, and that's pretty good, isn't it? But it takes a lot of effort to control this machine all day of every single day. Either the computer or the machine gets tired doing that, and that's kind of why we need sleep, okay? But, so we need to clock off for a while and regenerate both the computer and the machine. And so what we do is we kind of outsource the stuff, because you can't clock off completely, can you? What does that look like if you completely clock off computer and machine? It's death, uh, which is not particularly conducive to learning. <laughs> okay. So we have to outsource some stuff to what the stem of the brain. So that's your, your heartbeats, your breathing. And even today, while you're conscious, you're blinking is being controlled from the stem of your brain. Could you imagine today you had to remember to blink? I get halfway through an interesting tale and you scream, go blind, eyes dry over, again, not conducive to learning. Okay? So we need that to happen. But the two bits that I think are critical to know about are, first of all, the neocortex. Now, the neocortex, whether you're left or right brain, is the part of the brain that's responsible for thinking and reasoning, logic, language, all of that kind of stuff that's critically important in the learning environment. Would you agree that it's better when our students in the classroom are able to think rather than feel? that they do good learning when that... Would you agree that as educators, it's great in the classroom when you're able to think straight? Yeah. Would you agree that parents are easier to talk to when they're thinking rather than feeling? Yeah. But there's a part of our brain that keeps getting in the way, isn't there? And it's called the limbic system. Now, the limbic system is responsible for feeling. It's our emotional centre. There's a whole heap of componentry in it. The one that fascinates me most is amygdala. And a behavioural uh, psychologist who's a friend of mine explained amygdala to me as being like the traffic cop in the brain. It decides whether you're going to think or feel. Because if you notice that as human beings we're not particularly adept at doing both at the same time, that we're one or the other. Anyone in here ever had an argument with their partner? Yeah, we've got a couple who are going, yes, today. <laughs> okay. Ever had, anyone had an argument with their partner, walked away from the argument, and five minutes later gone, Oh, I should have said that. <laughs> if I had said that, if I'd used that line in the argument, I would have won like by 12 goals. I would be the king of the house. Uh, and, and then oh, I would be... In, but you don't think of it in the argument, do you? Because you're all emotional. And when we allow our emotional brain to do the language for us, it sucks at it. And we say some weird stuff in that argument, don't we? Who's ever walked away from the argument and gone, man, I really shouldn't have said that made it a lot worse, hasn't it? This is no good. Okay? And this is happening to us in the learning environment all the time. All the time. So our kids that come in with a filter of some sort of emotion, okay, every single emotion that we experience has been designed and evolved within us to help us to survive or to socialise. 
even fear, even the negative emotions. Now, why do we need fear? It's to keep us safe, isn't it? Do you imagine driving here today if no one felt fear? We need it. So what we need is our kids to recognise that negative emotions are there for a reason. Even horrible emotions like shame are there for a reason. Shame's our central social regulator. They're all there to trigger things. Fear is there to trigger the fight or flight mechanism. Shame is there to trigger conscience. Do we want our students to have a conscience? Yep. So what we need them to do is to associate those negative feelings with taking action so that they can walk away from them. And when they take that action, we get to thank and congratulate them for it. So when they do something wrong in a school, when they make a mistake, when they demonstrate a poor behaviour, our role is to stand next to them and to support them so that they can take action. Therefore, we get to pat them on the back, thank and congratulate them for, you, for them, and that is how we build trust in our organisations. Trust is built only on the opportunity to thank and congratulate people for doing things that you value. And that's how we build empathy in schools. Um, and then the third one's community. Okay? It's how we can reposition schools back into being the hub of communities, where relationships not only flow, but where they are formed. Okay? And if I was to ask you, what do you think that's changed the most in schools in the last 30 years? There might be a temptation here to talk about you know, uh, technology or even architecture. And I mentioned the architecture of my last school at Rosemary Primary School. But you know what? I don't think that has been the thing that has changed the most in schools in the last 30 years. I think the thing that has changed the most in schools in the last 30 years is that 30 years ago, if you got into trouble at school, you got into trouble twice. And it's not about the trouble. It's about the evidence of trust within the partnership between home and school. And so what we need to do is look at how can we rebuild trust so that we can get some big, good stuff done. It's very difficult, isn't it, to change big things in schools if you don't feel that the trust is there from the parent community to do that. We shy away from risk because we feel that we're going to come under fire, and I know this because I've tried. I've tried. One of the things that was different about Rosebury Primary School was that we were a school without homework. We looked at the literature and we said, you know what, the homework thing just isn't going to work for us. We're going to have to back away from that. We're, going to, we're not going to send home black line masters. We're not going to send home projects. We're going to send home the stuff that works, which is great quality home reading and anything that helps them learn automaticity and maths and English in a fun and interesting way. Songs, games, rhymes, all that sort of stuff. Nothing else. Okay? And I was invited to come and present a TED talk in Darwin Darwin's very first TED talk, and they said, could you unpack what it takes to build a new school? And I gave the example of the homework as something that we did that was different. Now, we had communicated this heavily with our parent community, and I presented the TED talk. As just a t uh, the homework was just like a tiny little 20-second example within it. But there was a reporter in the audience from the ABC, and she said to me, Vicky Kerrigan, she's lovely, and she said, that was fascinating about the homework. Can you come on the radio? And I said, look, I'm not allowed. You know, government school principal, I'm, I'm not allowed to do media. I'm, I'm a bit scared of that anyway. Can you, can, uh, Steve, the media guy at the, at the education department, is the guy you have to talk to. I can't help you. And I walked off. And 20 minutes later, my phone rang, and it was Steve. And he said, we've got a media request from ABC. They want to interview you. And I said, yeah, what do you want me to do, Steve? And he said, no, go do it. She seems really positive we could do with some good press. And I said, OK. I said, when does she want to do the interview? And he said, about 30 minutes. <laughs> I said, right. So I ran up to ABC offices in Darwin. I did the interview, and he was right. It was all positive. It was really good. And then my phone went in my pocket again about 30 minutes later. And it was a really interesting outlet in the media that you may have some level of awareness of. It was the NT News. Why are people laughing about the NT News? You know, they made a coffee table book out of NT News front covers. So bizarre, are they? You know, the favourite one was that the, the, the day you've got to buy the NT News every year is July the 2nd, because it's the day after Cracker Night in the Northern Territory. Fire night, fireworks are legal for one night in the NT. The place is like Beirut. Everything's on fire. Anyone like that? It's nuts. Anyone like that? And their most famous front page was on July the 2nd when it had a man standing on the front, on the front page of the NT News using a, a snake as a stubby holder while he's drinking this beer. And the headline underneath it is why I stuck a cracker up my clacker. <laughs> it's highbrow journalism, isn't it? So when the NT News rings, you kind of go, I don't want to talk to the NT News. <laughs> So uh, Steve and hung up. You know that, you know, 20 minutes later, Steve rings. So the NT News, I want to interview. I said, Steve, I don't want to talk to the NT News. This is a non-issue in my school. I don't want to do it. He went, yeah, you have to. I said, what do you mean I have to? And he said, they're going to rip you apart anyway. You might as well have a quote or two in there that defends yourself. Beauty. 
So I rang the reporter from the NT News and luckily he was quite positive about the whole thing. All good. I went home, slept well. Got up the next morning and as I was driving to school, I went, oh yes, I did an interview. Maybe I should get the paper because I thought maybe about page six, there'll be a, you know, a headline that says, you know, innovative principle leads the way. <laughs> as I drove into the servo, I saw the banner out the front that, um, that you know, they had the headline of the day on it and that's when my heart rate started to increase. And I got into the servo and I picked up the newspaper. <laughs> now, first of all, under a giant Photoshop crocodile, how good's that, eh? <laughs> School band at home, work about 14 words of text, continued page four. Oh, my life's gonna change. I got to school, got out of the car. My business manager, Marnie, got out of the car next to me and she said, um, are we in for an interesting day? And I said, yeah, we might be. I said, did you read the paper? And she said, no. I said, did you hear it on the radio? And she said, no. I said, what? And she said, Sunrise are running a poll about us and whether crazy ideas like this are what's wrong with Australian schools. <laughs> I went, right. And my world for two weeks was upside down, upside down, as the education department abandoned me and um, Steve disappeared from my life. <laughs> yeah. And I was left with the fallout. And after two weeks, I was exhausted. I sat down one Friday afternoon as everyone left the school and I turned my computer on and I looked at some of the online articles because this article got syndicated to every state and territory around Australia. It went to New Zealand, it went to Malaysia, it went to South Africa, it went to Canada, it went to Japan, it went to Iceland. I don't know what Iceland wanted to know with what I was doing in sweaty Darwin, but nevertheless, it went to Iceland. There was a Facebook page set up about me that said that they should not have given this bloke a principal job. Join, sign on, because I saw him down at the cricket club one day doing vodka laybacks. <laughs> Just totally untrue stuff. It was tequila. <laughs> <laughs> Horrible stuff that was said about me. And then I read some of the comments and I looked below and interdispersed amongst the, all of the nastiness and the bile and the rhetoric in there was comments from parents at my school. They said, you guys don't know what you're talking about. He told us about the homework policy when we enrolled. You guys don't know what you're talking about. He talked about this at assembly on the very first day. You guys don't know what you're talking about. This is the reason we enrolled our kids in the school. You guys don't know what you're talking about. One of them, my favourite one, was you guys don't know what you're talking about. You're the dickheads that have to sit up until one o'clock in the morning making, solar, making the solar system out of paper mache. <laughs> <laughs> Love that one. And it is the only time I can remember that a school community was mobilised in support of its school when they weren't even asked to. And it's a communication imperative that we have, is to let them know about what it is that we're doing around the key things that are genuinely important in a school. Which means that we, oops, we need to start to rethink the way that we work. Alvin Toffler said that the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who can't read and write, but those who can't learn, unlearn and then relearn new ways of doing things. So let's do a quick test, because I'm a teacher. Oh, I wrecked it. <laughs> so now I've got to do the teacher thing. Do I backtrack and pretend that didn't happen? <laughs> Hope that a certain percentage of the school didn't see it? Ah, don't worry about it. So this, you can use this one, okay? So what I'll do at the end of today is I'll give you an email address, and you can email me, and I'll send you the whole slide deck. You can use this on your staff back at school. It'll be good fun. So I tell them this is one country. Look at this, tell me what country it is. And they argue about it. it's got to be Scandinavia because we've got Finland envy in Australia. So we think that it must be them or it must be Singapore or it must be one of these countries. And it's not, it's England in 1900. Okay, all those things were true about England in 1900. And when you ask historians what happened to the British Empire, why is it no longer an empire like it was back then? They say that it's two things. One was that the British Empire lost sight of what it is that it stood for. It got seduced by naff little sayings, such as the sun that never sets on the British Empire. So they convinced themselves that what made them an empire was land acquisition, and it wasn't. The thing that went wrong for them was that they didn't have the necessary power and economy, military and money, to be able to, to maintain power and control in those places. So all of a sudden, there were uprisings around the world, weren't there? India uprose in its own interesting way, didn't it? Germany uprose in a reasonably interesting way too, didn't they? Australia, we were a lot more understated. 
We just went, yeah, yeah, we're just quietly around 1900. We'll start our own country if that's all right. But, you know, we'd like to stay in the Commonwealth Games because we dominate that shit, don't we? <laughs> yeah. All right, so we did it in a lot more understated way. But all of a sudden, England lost power because they were trying to do too much stuff. They forgot what it was that they stood for. Anyone own a Nokia 3310? Who loved their Nokia 3310? Like, I love my Nokia 3310 mainly because it did its one job, which was to make phone calls. Well, it had one and a half jobs because there was Snake as well, wasn't there? Right. But it did its one job of making phone calls brilliantly, didn't it? Like, you could walk along on a phone, making a phone call on a Nokia 3310, drop it in a puddle, and it would just bounce back up in your hand and just keep talking. <laughs> Loved it. Yet somehow, we were made brand disloyal, weren't we? And we jumped over. What was that about? It was because Nokia didn't realise that their job was, that, that what their business was, was not making phone calls at all. They weren't even the first to make it easier for us to make phone calls. I remember my father, my father bringing home what I thought was the greatest invention of all time, which was the extension cord for the landline. I was 15 with three younger sisters. I could now ring a girl without all of them looking at me like this. It was, I could get to the laundry. It was awesome. And, all that. and what, what Apple did was work out that actually what they're in the business of is taking something that we already have to do and want to do and make it easier for us to do it. They personalise that experience for us. And that's what happens with one of these. By the time you walk 100 metres from an Apple store with a new phone, you have put the apps that you want on the phone and you have personalised this device to help you to do the things you already want and need to do more easily and in a more mobile kind of way. When organisations lose track of what it is that they stand for, they go under. They become irrelevant. Does anyone remember these guys? What was their thing? What, was their, what were they into? What did they dominate? Film, photography. But they didn't realise that for most people, taking a photo is not a pleasant experience. For photographers, it is. But for me, with three younger sisters, my mum taking a photo on the last roll, on the last picture on the roll of film using this product was not pleasant. <laughs> Adam, smile properly! Oh, I am! No, properly! All right, I'm sorry! It's a horrible experience. Most people don't want to take photos. There's something they do want to do with photos, though, isn't it? Share them. And the second that people like Instagram came along and realised what they don't need to do is to just get better at taking photos, you need to provide a different thing to people to do what they really want to do with this system. I think that the next industry that's under threat is potentially our supermarket industry. If you're like me, I get tired of always wanting to know stuff. It gets pretty frustrating. That's from Amazon Dash. Save today. With that simple design, it makes ordering groceries a piece of cake. Just hold down the voice button and say anything you want. It's always ready to go. Chocolate chips. And the barcode scanner is really fun to use. You never have to worry about being out of something you need. With Amazon Dash, you can order over 500,000 items. Guitar strings. Strawberry yogurt. Apples. You can check out from the Amazon Fresh website or smartphone apps. Most orders arrive the next day. And things get delivered right to your door. How cool is that? No more parking lots, waiting in lines, or losing kids in the store. <laughs> now you'll have more time in your day, so you'll never miss those special moments. Amazon Dash. Shopping made simple. How was that, Dad? Just quick show of hands. Anyone want one? Oh, I do. I don't. I, I, not everyone does. A lot of people still like to pick their own apples. But what they've realised is that a lot, for a lot of us, we don't actually like the experience of going to the supermarket. My, the IGA down at Dramana is busting a gut trying to get me there. I mean, even though the car park is like it's been designed by a drunk five-year-old and all that, the, I go in there and there were recently there were, there were opera singers in the fruit and veg section standing up belting out Ness and Dorma. And all that. You know, it's not helping me to, to order my bacon. Uh, but they're trying to make the shopping a pleasant experience for me. But I don't want a more pleasant shopping experience. I just want my stuff. 
And for a large proportion of a busy population, Amazon are the ones that have started to realise that. So my question to you is, could we be next? Could our education system be the next Kodak, the next Nokia 3310, because we potentially have lost sight of what it is that we really stand for? If you think about your purpose and how much that is actually enacted in your practice every single day as an educator or as a school leader, I think we start to see that there are some canaries in the coal mine, aren't there? We look at the, look at the studies that are done, and there's not a lot around studies that are done that mesh the, the two notions of school leaders and um, classroom teachers. But when you bring some of that data together, you start to see that the two things that stand out that are stressing our teachers and our school leaders is, first of all, student behaviour. That's the stuff that's keeping people up at night. And I've actually had an argument with that. I was recently called in to do some work at the university that was looking at their pre-service teacher education. And they were saying, look at this. Our teachers are worried about this. It's affecting their well-being. They're up until one o'clock in the morning worrying about the behaviour that happened that day. I said, hold it there. I said, no, they're not. And they said, but look at it. The evidence is right there. I said, I don't reckon teachers are up until one o'clock in the morning worried about the behaviour that happened that day. I think they're worried that there's no plan that it'll be any better tomorrow. So it's about, as a school, can we say we're going to go with full intent around understanding the way that that behavioural culture works and we're going to put in a repeatable methodology for being able to transfer behaviours from the tolerate pile to the encourage pile. And at the moment, I don't think we have evidence that we're committed genuinely to that. Principals, this is Stanford University, looked at principals across a number of different Western countries and they found that principals are spending 0.44% of their time discussing kids with teachers. And that may not be the case in your school. It may be higher than that. But one thing I will bet on is that your principal wishes they could spend more than they're currently spending on that time. It's 1 63rd of the time that they spend on their total administrative load. That's not purpose in practice. And the second thing we need to look at is look at that's affecting people is workload. And this goes back to my point about quality teaching and what we've done in that space, which is basically give people more to do. So let's look at what we really stand for in schools these days. We stand for teaching, I saw I read an article recently that said we have to teach kids financial literacy because they have credit card debt at 15, that's going to be your fault. We need to teach them to swim. So what you need to do is organise a 45 minute lesson that's going to take all day to organise and spend forever getting our H&S forms organised. You need to teach them technology, but I don't want you to be technologically obsessed because you know, if my kid's on Fortnite too much, I'm blaming schools for that as well. We need to get rid of bullying. So we need to make sure that everybody feels good and safe and, and everything at school, but we're not going to give you any resources to be able to do that. We're not going to make sure that you teach kids to read and write. We want you to teach them sex ed as well because that's, and we don't want to do that at home anymore. So we're going to get you to do that. We're going to make sure you teach them social skills because what we would like is for you to be able to make sure that if kids play up down at the train station, that that's going to be absolutely your fault. You need to have a breadth of curriculum, even though we're going to reduce your teaching staff. And we're going to make sure that you eliminate childhood obesity while you're at it as well. We want you to include a performing arts program in, in the school as well because we would really like a big concert to go to at the end of the year that's going to make everybody feel fantastic, even if it does take three and a half days every term four. We want you to eliminate um, uh, the young employment problem that we have in Australia and make sure that everybody's work capable and while we're doing it we'd like you to wear a white blouse and smile and don't look tired. <laughs> is there any evidence that we've perhaps forgotten what it is that we truly need to stand for? And I would suggest there are two things we need to stand for. One is how is it, what's the process that we use, that we, do, that we deliver, what's the culture we create? where not only kids feel safe and comfortable to learn effectively, but where they leave knowing that they are a capable learner and they actually love learning. And the second thing is, how is it that we are working in partnership with our parents to turn these kids into fantastic citizens? And what we need to do is to start screaming our expertise about this stuff from the rooftops. Because we've got a problem, don't we, that the community doesn't trust teachers just as, mu as much as they used to. Because we've played safe we write newsletters that go out there that list the kids that won a Student of the Week award last week and give a thank you to a teacher that went on excursion. But we don't tell them how it is that we reduce bullying and re referrals by 25%. We don't tell them how it is that Year 5 NAPLAN results in writing went up by 15 points. We don't even use the word pedagogy because it might confuse them. I think that they should be confused. Let them come and ask. Because you, who would you ask to find out about pedagogy? An expert. You. Having gone to school does not make you an expert. Using the system does not make you an expert. If that theory stood up, then taking a crap makes you a qualified plumber. 
The experts are the people who work in and on the system every day, and we need to start speaking our expertise like that very loudly if we want people to trust us again. And I think it's doable. And I think that what happens when we do it is we get some fantastic stories. And I'd like to finish today by telling you about one such story that was part of my world quite a few years ago now, and then bobbed up again. Uh, the, the young woman you can see in the top left there is a, a woman called Hayley Ross. Uh, I taught Hayley many years ago for two years, in year five and year six at Sky Primary School down on the Mornington Peninsula. And Hayley went through a difficulty that many teachers help their kids through, and that is that mum and dad split. You know, for lack of a better term, uh, dad shot through unexpectedly, and mum, who you can see Bromman in the middle there, was suddenly a single mum, and I thought that she was the poster child for single parents. Extraordinarily strong woman. Came to every single event that happened at the school, was on the school council, supported us in a ridiculous number of ways. She used to run sleepovers at her house, where she would invite 12 kids from the house, from my class, to come and sleep in her house on a Friday night. Six boys and six girls. The girls would sleep down the front of the house, the boys would sleep down the back of the house, and Bromwell would sleep in the hallway, so that never the twain shall meet in the night. A month later, she'd run another sleepover and insist that Haley invited the 12 kids who didn't come the first time. Every kid in my class had slept in Bromwell's house. Like I said, I thought she was an amazingly strong woman, but what I didn't know was that the cracks were starting to appear. She hid it well. She couldn't hide it from her own mother, though. Haley and Tegan, who you can see in the middle there, she didn't hide it from, her, from their grandmother. And, her, and their grandmother said to Bronwyn, you need a break. So what I've done is I've arranged for the girls to come and stay with me for a week. I've bought you and your friend Marilyn some plane tickets, booked some accommodation. You're going to sit on the beach, you're going to drink margaritas, you're going to get a tan, you're going to come back refreshed. It's October. We'll get you through to Christmas and get you another break. We're going to look after you. Nice thing to do, eh? Yep. Uh, Bronwyn and her friend Marilyn were in the Sari Club when it was bombed by terrorists in 2001. I got up the next morning on the Sunday and I saw the old Sunday program on Channel 9 and I had an argument in my head between my neocortex and my limbic system. The neocortex was saying lots of Australians in Bali, Adam, I'm sure she's fine. The limbic system saying, this is not good. And 24 hours later, we hadn't heard from Bronwyn, which could mean only one thing. And I arrived at school the next morning and I walked from my car to my, towards my classroom and a well-meaning assistant principal caught me. And, um, she, and, I, and I asked her the only question I could think of, which was, what do I do? And she said, I've been thinking about it too, Adam. I think school needs to be the rock. School needs to be the consistent force in these kids' lives. School needs to be unaffected by the tragedy that's going on at the moment. And she said, for the moment, Adam, I want you to keep it as normal as you can. In fact, I don't want you to mention the incident to the kids just yet. Pretend it hasn't happened. And I went, all right. And I walked about 10 metres, and it was the first time in my career that I led. No way was it fair for me to expect those kids to not be in a limbic state on that day. So we instituted some circles as a group where we got together every morning and sat in a circle and just had a yarn. How you going? How you going? What's going on for you? How can we respond? We had an individual support system, which was a tap on the shoulder, which meant that if a kid tapped me on the shoulder once, that meant I'm going outside for five minutes. If they tapped me twice, it meant I'm going outside, please follow me. And if they tapped me three times, it meant I'm going outside, please follow me in five minutes. And we worked them through as well as we could until the day came about two weeks later that I knew was coming. When I got out of my car again in the morning and a girl called Jessica walked up to my car and she said, Mr. Voigt, Haley's back. And I said, right I threw him my keys. I said, take yourself into the little office next to our classroom. Take Haley. I'll be there in a minute. It is the most vivid moment of my entire teaching experience was to look down at that little girl, 11 years old, still find it hard to talk about sometimes, to look down at that little girl and have her look up at me and say, Mr. Voigt, my mum's dead. I said, yeah, I know. And I gave her a cuddle and we put in place the things that we could to try and help her through the final six weeks of her primary school. We sent her off to high school. Hope for the best. About three years ago, through the magic of Facebook, I got a friend request from a Haley Ross. Don't like doing the former student thing on Facebook. Feels a bit icky to me. Then I did a little calculation of how old she is, and I went, oh, I'm so getting old. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I accepted out of curiosity, and she immediately struck up a conversation with me. So first know that you hear Haley's story today with her full permission. And I said, could you tell me a little bit more about the story from your point of view, not mine, so I don't warp it through my own experience? And she said, sure. She sent me some photos, you can see here, and she sent me a letter. 
Uh, you can see here the picture that uh, one of the girls in the class, Lauren, herded the kids onto the playground equipment and said, uh, got a photo taken. And these are in the days when you had to, like, if you wanted a, a photo printed in colour, you had to pay with a limb at your school. And so she tricked me into printing it in colour, made a poster out of it, got everyone to sign it, and then handed it over to Hayley. Um, this is the signature teddy bear that Regan, my ruckman in the class, blew his pocket money on, brought it into school and got everyone to sign it. I'm not entirely convinced that Regan didn't say to a few people, smile it or bash it. <laughs> Yet sign it, we all did. And Regan rode it to Haley's house on his BMX bike that afternoon, 11 kilometres. Um, in our circle the next morning, one of the kids asked Regan, what'd you do that for? And he said she'd lost a favourite thing to cuddle, she needed a replacement. In Haley's letter to me, she said that one of the toughest parts about the time that she lost her mum was the sense of disconnection that she felt only because her family were trying to do the right thing, absolutely. Um, that for two weeks they kept her away from the next most connected people that she had in her life. She said that classroom to her was not a classroom, it was a lounge room, it was where she felt home. And she said she became determined as she moved into her adult life not to let those people down who had supported her at that time. In her words, she said, I will not become the teenager that slips into drugs, alcohol and prostitution because something awful happened to me. I will get passionate about new life coming into the world, not life going out of it. You know what she studied at the end of her high school years? Midwifery. And she went out there and she brought new life into the world. And I as an educator, oh, she had to stop after a while too because she ended up um, bringing her own little life into the world. I've met little Charlie and he's an absolute ripper. Um, and I guess what I want to do today is to emphasise to you that even though the wonderful stuff that happens as a result of your focus on building great learners and terrific citizens in the kids that you work with, even though most of the great stuff happens when you can't see it, the work that you are doing as nation builders in building young people the work that you do in eliminating some of all of those little things that we think are important and getting back to the things that genuinely matter is what builds a country, is what builds a nation. And even though the respect that we have for teachers has started to drop away, I think that there's something we can do about it if we can share stories like Haley's and share stories like, of, of schools like Haley's that genuinely make a difference. Because learning is not a commodity. Learning is not something that I can sprinkle across the room and hope that you get it. Learning is a transformational force and when we as educators hold the hands of young people and help them to step into the river of that force, we just don't know where it's going to take them. We have no idea. The opportunities for you to learn and to transform are all around you. They're absolutely everywhere. They're in your homes, they're in your classrooms, they're in your staff meetings, they're all around the world. This is me at, a, at an orphanage that we took out, my family and I went to, a good friend of mine runs the Hands Across the Water charity that funds orphanages across Thailand. And when we visited there with my family, we both learned and transformed. Transformed to just a new level of gratitude for my family and I that I hope we never step out of. I learned also. I learned the answer to that time-worn, infuriating question, how much is infinity? That is the number of times that three Thai boys on the back of an overweight Australian will expect him to fall down and stand up on a 38 degree afternoon. If you'd like to get in touch with us, there are some, there are some forms on your table. Um, basically, I guess after days like this, what happens sometimes is that people come and say to me, Adam, can you run a PD day at our school? And the answer is no. I won't do that to you. I'm not going to take your money, put on a show, and then leave to have nothing change in three weeks later. The schools that work with us, yes, they get training and they get good training. Uh, but we also work in classrooms. We mentor the leaders to put implementation plans in place. We, teach, we coach the teachers, we provide resource, we make a full transformational change in your school over a three-year journey. For some of our secondary schools, that's resulted in a reduction of suspensions by up to 400%. And for some of our primaries, we've been able to drive up student learning outcomes and also, at the same time, drive up stakeholder perception data for all three of those stakeholder groups that you saw on the postcards before. If you would like to have a chat about that for, for your school, fill out that form. I'm not going to come around and collect them. If you would, just take a photo, send it to the mobile number that's on there or send it to the email address that's on there. Um, if you'd like to just get some resources, there's a membership offer. And if you'd like, for, if nothing else, just to be welcomed into our world, get an email every couple of weeks about what's going on with real schools, then, um, then just tick the one that says ebook, and we'll send you a free ebook, and we'll, we'll send you a reminder about that as we move forward. Can I thank you today, not for your engagement, um, not for your applause, in fact, can I ask you, don't applaud? 
You know, I appreciate the gratitude, I really do, okay? But applause is this odd little Western, cult, uh, Western custom that we have that says, yay, we're finished. <laughs> and you're not. The work that you've got to do creating more Hayley Rosses in the world is just starting right of now. Um, so I'll end by saying enjoy the rest of the conference and make the absolute best of it. Thank you very much, everyone. Don't clap. <laughs> I'm watching. I'm watching. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, Adam, thanks very much once again. I personally take away so many things from that speech, um, most notably refocusing my attention on the biggest rock of all in schools, and that is our focus on young people. So thank you for that. Um, as a father of five-and-a-half-year-old triplets, um, they are your rock. <laughs> you poor thing. <laughs> I'm sure it's lovely. <laughs> Sometimes, um, but, but we do get very busy in schools and, and, and the one slide in that, in that deck that, I, that I'll resonate, resonate with me most loudly is the one with all of those little squares and little images. Sometimes we focus too heavily on those. Um, so I know that everyone in this room are the sort of people that I work with and they're committed to young people. So thanks very much again.